Hi everyone, my name is Abriza Jaws and I work as a doctor in the NHS and welcome to another episode of our In Focus series where we try and condense information into small snippet videos so you can get exactly the information that you need in a short amount of time. Today's topic is about jobs in the NHS. So it's important when you first start working in the United Kingdom that you should try finding a job in the NHS. And what I mean by that is try not to go into a private job or work in a private hospital. The reason for this is the NHS hospitals have a lot of support, you will have a great environment, and you'll be able to understand and work how the NHS is before you progress in your career. Now there are two types of jobs that you can look into applying for once you start out. Non-training jobs, and training jobs. If you are new to the, to the United Kingdom and this is your first job, I would highly recommend applying for a non-training job. Now, let me give you the reasons for this. First of all, you've never worked in the United Kingdom before. You need to understand how everything is. Even if you've seen every video there is about the NHS, even if you've read every blog there is about working in the UK as a doctor, it's one thing to read and it's another thing to experience and it would be in your best interest if you try and apply for a non-training job just for a couple of months or maybe up to a year so that you can fully integrate yourself into the system. There is a lot of confusion regarding non-training jobs and a lot of times people think, well, no, but I want to be a trainee. I want to become a consultant. Okay, that's fine. If you're in a non-training position, this doesn't mean you can never make that transition into a training job, okay? It's just, it's good for you and it's good for the people when you later on apply that you have some NHS experience first. Your job as a non-trainee level, whatever level that is, and we will discuss levels in a second, it will be equivalent to what a person in a training post will be doing. You will have the same responsibilities Oftentimes you'll even have the same salary. You may even have more of a salary if you can negotiate because of your experience. That being said, the things that might be a little different is a person in a training program will obviously have a structured system to ensure that they are preparing and training well and doing whatever sort of study leave opportunities are available for trainees. That doesn't mean you won't get study leave you should speak to your HR and your trust about how much time you will get for study leave and your allowance for your study bu budget. But you may just be limited to the study opportunities within your trust versus with a uh, trainee, they have more opportunities within the deanery, okay? So definitely when you look to apply, start with a non-training job. Now there's another thing that people get kind of confused about. Sometimes, you know, we might come to the UK a little late and we might think, well, I've done whatever I wanted to do back in my home country, but in the United Kingdom, I just don't have the time or the energy to do that run around again and go into training. Can I stay in a non-training post? And the answer is yes. Definitely, you'll have to speak with your trust or the HR or when you're hired about this, but that does not mean you cannot stay in a non-training post. Not everyone who comes to the United Kingdom gets into a training post. And that doesn't mean that they didn't have the opportunity to. That just means they don't choose to. In the US, it's different. The process is streamlined. People go straight into training and there are no non-training posts available. But in the UK, it's not like that. You can be in a non-training post and still have progression by way of salary and experience and opportunities, but you just won't get to that end of the line as a consultant. You can become a registrar and you can stay as a non-trainee in that sense. You just won't get through a training program and that's okay if that's what you want to do. Now let's talk about job titles and what they mean in a training and non-training sense. Now when I'm going to be referring to jobs that are non-training, I'm going to be saying at that level. For instance, we know about the foundation years like FY1 and FY2. FY1 equivalent or FY1 level would be a non-training post. Same with FY2 level or CT1 level, CT2 level. When we first start out working in the NHS, a lot of us think, well, what level should I start at? And definitely, like I mentioned before, it's a good idea to go for a non-training post. Just because it is your first job in the NHS, I don't want you all to restrict yourselves to the FY1 level. And the reason for that is, first of all, it's, it's the bottom of the totem pole, which isn't bad. We all start at the bottom. 
but you have some insight into how to be a doctor and work in, the, in, in, a, in a hospital environment because you've done your internship at home and perhaps you have some more experience. The level of, of responsibilities that an FY1 has to an FY2 is really not that different. And I would highly recommend that if you are still a little bit unsure about how you would proceed in the NHS to try for an FY2 level post. That being said, if you're a little more confident or if you think, you know what, I'll try for this and I'll see about maybe getting help if I need it, I would definitely suggest then you try for CT1 level or CT, sorry, ST1 level jobs. These are at the same names. I mean, some people say CT1 level, some people say ST1 level, but they have the same responsibilities. That being said, um, you will have more work than somebody who is your FY2 level counterpart. You as a non-training CT1 level, CT1 level being you're not in a training position, you still have the same responsibilities as an individual who is in a training CT1, and you are still senior to a person who is in a training FY2 and in a training FY1. You are at that level that an individual in CT1 is at, but you are not in a structured training program. I hope that makes sense. Your responsibilities are similar to that as a CT1 trainee and a CT2 trainee, but you are just in a non-training post. Individuals who are ST3 and above in a training program are registrars, and those are the people that maybe you'll see as, oh, this is the medical registrar or the surgical registrar, orthopedic registrar. They will have their varying levels of STs until they get to the end of the line. If you, however, start as a ST level in a non-training post, you can be I mean, you can continue in that non-training post as a registrar or as a specialty doctor, or if you get to the end of the line, as in you, you gain a lot of experience, but you don't really complete the training, you would be an associate specialist. What I'm trying to do here is make you all understand that you can go either way. You can stay on the non-training pathway and still get somewhere, or you can switch halfway, change tracks from non-training, get into training and get to the end of the line. Okay, it's not a dead end and it's not very confusing once you sit there and understand. But a lot of times when people ask me what kind of jobs should I apply for when I start off in the NHS, I would definitely recommend that you try and apply for FY2 level, CT1 level jobs. Sometimes these jobs might have different titles when you go to the NHS website. It might say trust grade. It might say junior clinical fellow, junior specialty registrar. You need to know what level these posts are. Trust grade can even be FY1 because you are at a trust grade, you're at a non-training post. So when you apply, if it just says trust grade or junior clinical fellow or something to that extent, when you sit for the interview, definitely clarify what is your actual job title at what level are you working at and what will your responsibilities be because you don't want it to be that oh well everyone says to apply for trust you know trust grade jobs i went and applied for a trust grade job but i have an fy1 rota because that can happen so definitely 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 do your homework before you apply and during your interview process don't shy away from asking the questions about where you can see yourself pr progressing in that hospital not trust because at the end of the day it's your life and you need to know what you're gonna do next now let's talk about the most important part how much you would get paid it really comes down to your basic pay and your gross pay and we have discussed basic pay at length at your level in our post on our blog uh, doctors pay in the UK which you can find in the description box below but I, what I really want to do right now is kind of elaborate on what it is that this basic pay is and what you can expect in your gross pay if you have some enhancements so your basic pay means if you work the most basic rota for your level that means usually nine to five or eight to four or whatever it is that your hospital works on normal hours from Monday to Friday this means there aren't any antisocial hours as they call it. There are no nights, weekends, late hours, anything like that. If you're someone who doesn't have a lot of time to do those kind of shifts, you can opt for only taking a job where you will get basic pay. Okay? Now, if however you are in a more rigorous rota where you will have on calls or you will have these antisocial hours, maybe you'll start work 
late in the day at 3 p.m. to midnight or 5 p.m. to 1 a.m. or something where you're gonna be working more often in the evenings or having on calls on the weekends or even nights on the weekends. These will be added into your basic pay as enhancements. So again, you have two options when you discuss with your HR, when you sit down with your, with your trust for your interview. Are you going to be paid a basic pay for your level or with that basic pay, will there be some enhancements because of the rota that will then put, be all put together as your gross pay? This gross pay is usually what's on your certificate of sponsorship or your COS once you accept the job and then you submit all of that for your tier two visa. So it's very, very important that you know what it is that you are getting paid because your basic pay should be at the correct rate for your level. It's just the enhancements which may vary depending on your rota. So that's where your gross pay then can be different. Now, all of that aside, let's talk about banding. Banding is, is, is kind of the bane of everyone's existence right now because no one's really sure what it is. First and foremost, it doesn't really exist the way it used to anymore. It used to be that with your basic pay, oh, you get 20% banding, 30% banding, 40% banding, and then all of that together would be your total, what you'd get at the, you know, at the end of the year. It's not like that anymore because like I said before, it's heavily dependent on the type of rota that you will be working. If your rota, even as a unsocial rota, is otherwise fairly relaxed, you, you shouldn't be expecting a lot in enhancements because you're not working as many on calls or as many antisocial hours as maybe somebody else who has a very, very tight and packed rota where they have a lot of on calls or a lot of late shifts or antisocial hour shifts. So that's something you need to keep in mind. With your basic pay, how much are your you know, on calls, how much of your rota is antisocial, those two things together, gross pay. All right, now we get to the best part, how to apply for jobs. So a lot of people kind of get confused here because they think it's something that they're not going to be able to do. And that's understandable. I mean, the structure here that they have about how you need to apply for jobs is, is, is very different than it would be for many of us in our home countries. So I don't expect all of you to just be like, oh, this is great. I know exactly what I need to do and I'm going to go do it and it's going to be done. That's why we have a post about it. So we've explained, you can check it in the description box below, how to apply for jobs in the NHS, but there are some things that I do want to run by you as tips and advice. First things first, when you're applying for jobs on the NHS website, use those words that I mentioned earlier, trust grade, junior clinical fellow, and see again what level they're at. Are they at an FY2 level or a CT1 level? Search for those as well, but ensure, of course, that they are the kind of jobs that you're looking for. Check the person's specifications. See if you fulfill the criteria. No one's asking that you must fulfill every single point, but there should at least be a good majority that you do fulfill before you apply. Now let's talk about the application process. The great thing about NHS jobs right now, the website versus how it used to be, is that you can complete basically a skeleton application where you fill in all of your information, talk about your internship, other relevant clinical experience, things that you've done that you're proud about. You should go at length and brag about it. This is not the time to be modest because you want the employer to see what you're talking about and say, you know what? I wanna interview this person because I think that they're gonna fit this job perfectly. So you go ahead and do that and you talk about exactly what you used to do but please do not embellish, do not lie, tell the truth. It's not gonna be of any benefit if you can say you can do all these things and they bring you in for the interview and then you know they, they find out that you can't. You're just wasting their time and it doesn't look good for you either, okay? Now, with this application, once you're done, you can apply to multiple posts with the skeletal application, the skeleton of an application. There might be sometimes with different applications, you might have to add additional information, but that's fine. You will have the one thing already done. You're not gonna to have to retype it up every time. Just make sure once you made your first initial application, you save it and you save that to be the main application that you want to continue to use later on when you share, okay? Or when you apply for jobs. So now let's talk about another thing that they, might, they may ask you in the application. They may ask you sometimes to upload your CV. It'll say on there that it's optional, but I would kind of put it more as a desirable than an optional. 
It's not, it's definitely not mandatory. You don't have to, but it's better if you do upload a CV. And um, if you're confused about how to do that, or if it's been a while since you have made a CV, we have an extensive post that you can find in the link in the, sorry, a link for in the description box below called creating the perfect CV. And again, with your CV, do not be shy. Talk about all of your experiences and all the things that you can do. But again, don't say things that you can't do. If you know you can't do it, if you don't have that experience, don't put it in the CV with the hopes that, oh, well, maybe they'll call me in for an interview. Definitely, definitely, definitely the most important thing when you apply for jobs is being as truthful and as forthcoming as possible and apply for a lot of jobs. I mean, right now the NHS needs doctors. How long they'll need it is, is not something anyone can really give you a surety on. But you have the golden opportunity right now to apply for jobs. A lot of us get disheartened very quickly because you're like, oh man, I applied for like 50 jobs and I've not heard back yet. There are a lot of things you've taken into consideration. First of all, you're not the only person applying. Yes, that doesn't mean that there aren't any jobs because that means so many people are applying. But think about the persons that have to sit there and then go through those applications. It can't just be done like that. Another thing to keep into consideration is when is the closing date of that job? Sometimes you'll apply for a job and you'll be like, this is the job I want. This is exactly what I want to do. And you've applied for it and you're sitting at home and you're waiting. You're like, why hasn't anyone called me? Why don't I know when this interview is going to happen? Oh no, I'm not going to get a job. Now what am I going to do? I put all this money into doing this and now I'm not getting an interview. But you failed to check when is the closing date for that job. Sometimes the closing date might be three months away. They're not going to, I mean, you might have the perfect CV, but they're not going to stop and be like, well, you know what guys? That's it, we found this guy, we were just gonna close the applications. It would be great if they did that. And sometimes on job applications, they will say, if they feel that they've gotten enough candidates, they may close the closing date a little bit earlier. But don't think that'll always happen. If you're really, really pressed, and you really, really, really want to get an interview in as soon as possible, maybe just to practice. Maybe because you're like, no, I need to get from where I am to where I wanna be now look at the closing date. Try and apply for as many jobs as you can that have a very close closing date. Even if it's one day, apply for a job. Even if it's gonna close, the closing date's tomorrow. Even if it's next week, even if it's a month away. Because usually within two weeks, two to four weeks, you'll hear something back, one way or the other. Some trusts will not say anything and you can't do anything about it. You'll just never hear back from them. And that's fine, that's their loss. But more often than not, they'll give you an email, you know, sorry, you know, you, you sent this application, but at this time, whatever, whatever. And you don't think about that. You don't let that sit at the back of your mind because you're better than that. And whatever job out there that's great for you, it will come to you. So what you're going to be waiting for is that phone call that, hey, hi, we want you come for this interview or that email or something to that extent saying, let's set up a interview. This interview might be in person or this may interview may be over the phone or by Skype. Now, if you get a six months visa and you have the opportunity and the financial means to stay within the United Kingdom, I would definitely tell you to stay here and do your interviews. The reason for this is I'm one of those people who I want to see where I work. I am not satisfied with just looking at pictures or just getting reviews from other people who work there. I need to know, is it right for me? So what I like to do is when I have an interview somewhere, I'll either get there a little bit early or make sure I can stay a little bit late and just kind of wander. I want to see the town. I want to see what kind of things are available in the hospital, what kind of amenities, how the people who work there look, if that makes any sense. I'm not expecting everyone to be like super happy and like, oh my God, this is the greatest place to work. But you, you get a sense of, of the environment when you walk through a hospital and if, you feel that it's right for you if you feel inside that you know this is this is some place that I can see myself working it's definitely worth it to try and do that if you can't it's completely understandable not everyone has the chance to do that and Skype interviews or telephone interviews are just as good just please 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 try and get as much information as you can about a place before you start working there because you don't want to be in a situation where you know you've committed to this you put all your money in one place you get there and you realize this isn't the kind of place that you thought it would be. Okay, you've gotten an interview. 
it's great, you're happy, you're super, super excited because now you finally have that feel that you can get a job in the United Kingdom. But what will you do for the interview? I know a lot of us get really scared because this is our, our first real interview, maybe for some of us, that this is our first job outside of internship where you're going to be working as a doctor and people are going to look at you and have respect for you and expect you to know things. So you get terrified. You're like, oh, what am I supposed to say in this thing? I want them to like me. I want them to hire me. Now the entire interview process, starting with what to do before the interview, the questions you can expect during the interview and the questions to ask after the interview and how to finalize your first job in the NHS. We have an entire series on that linked in the description box below. Our entire interview series is a definite must read. After you go get through it, I can 100% guarantee you, you will not have any confusion about how to proceed. But let me just give you some quick tips right now about how to go about your interview and what would be great so that you can make sure that you feel confident going in and coming out. First things first, do not be late. If you are attending this interview in person or if you're doing it on Skype or whatever on a phone call, do not be late. I know that it can be difficult, especially if you are trying to do it over, over Skype and you've not got the you know best internet connection or something else goes off and for some reason it doesn't work out. But definitely somewhere or another, try and let your HR know if something comes up or if, you know, life happens. If you can't make an interview, it is your prerogative to let them know you cannot show up. It's not polite for you not to just show up because they've taken their time out. There are consultants there that are coming to interview you. HR has come there. You need to be respectful of their time because they set up this interview for you. So you need to let them know that you're taking it very seriously. Now, let's talk about if you actually attend your interview in person. The most important thing, again, to not be late, whatever way you need to get there, be it by train, if you're driving or whatever, make sure you make sure there's enough time for you to get to the hospital and then find out where you need to go. It doesn't mean anything if you get to the hospital on time and spend two hours roaming trying to figure out where you need to go. That's, that's not good for you. It's not good for, for, the, uh, for the trust either. So get there on time, get there a little early, stay calm. <laughs> and I know that's really, really easy to, for me to say right now, but definitely take a couple of deep breaths. Don't try and study fervishly outside, like what can they ask me, think about all the questions they can ask me, what, what, what can happen, what can happen, what can happen, because you'll just stress yourself out. When it comes to clinical scenarios, just go into doctor mode. Don't go into student mode. A lot of us go into this medical student mode where we're thinking like a medical student thinks, like what is the process? What is the history taking? What is all this that it says in the book? No, go from your experience. You are an experienced individual. Take that with you into the interview. Be confident, smile, dress nicely. When I say that, I mean, think about business casual. It doesn't need to be super formal. Wear something comfortable, wear something appropriate. If it's cold, wear a light sweater. Maybe, you know, if you're wearing a heavy jacket, obviously don't, don't come in there with a heavy jacket. Keep it outside, but be comfortable in yourself. The most important thing about the interview is being comfortable. You can be the best candidate. You can know exactly what they want to hear, and you can tell them exactly what they want to know about you. But if you are a bundle of nerves, you're not going to come across well. And the reason that this is important is you're somebody that you're going to be talking to a lot of people. You're going to be talking to patients. You're going to need to seem and come across as reassuring. A really good thing, a really good way to do that is to practice at least like you did for PLAB2, if any of you all took PLAB2 with someone or with a mirror, how you're going to talk and how you're going to kind of break through, you know, break down your process to your interviewees about who you are and why you want this job and what it is that they should know about you so that they do select you for this job. The same thing kind of goes for the Skype interviews or telephone interviews. I know those tend to be a little bit shorter, but definitely try and be as confident as possible and don't don't try and keep a book or something nearby that you're going to keep looking at and then looking back at them and thinking they won't notice that you're doing that. That's, that's just not good ethics. I mean, if, if you're not going to be doing that in front of them, don't do it, you know, via telecom or via a webcam or whatever. Definitely, 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 whatever interviews you get, go for them, do well and be confident. 
if you think, oh man, I totally bombed that interview, it didn't go well at all, I couldn't, you know, think about what I wanted to say, I kept getting jumbled, just don't think about it again. I mean, I had an interview like that, I thought it'd be terrible, and they gave me the job offer, and I was just like, I don't know what they want, <laughs> why would they give me this job offer? Um, but when, you, you, you know, we tend to be very critical about ourselves. You might have thought you did terrible, but you did enough to make them like you, and that's the most important thing. Don't get hung up on the little things. If you don't know the answer, tell them, I don't know, but I will find out. If you're in a situation where they're like, okay, what would you do here? And you're thinking to yourself, uh, you know, I just, I just, I feel overwhelmed. Tell them that you would get help. It's great that the structure and support in, in the hospitals are such that you can go and find someone who can come and help you. Sometimes the answer to the questions they ask you, they don't expect you to know what to do next, but they do expect you to know when to ask for help. And that's something that you should really keep in mind, not only in the interview, but also when you start your jobs. Know when to ask for help. Other than that, take the interview, you know, for what it is, and make sure at the end of the interview, if they tell you, you know, if you got the job or you don't got the job, it's great if they tell you right then and there. If they say, you know, we'll be in touch, try and ask them, okay, but when can I expect to hear back? Be as polite as possible about it. Don't be like, oh, well, you know, I'm applying for so many jobs and I really need to know about this because it'll come off as, you know, it won't come off as very nice. Just give them an idea that, hey, it would be great if I could hear back from you all within a week's time if possible, because they're busy too. They must have to interview a lot of people. Just let them know that you'd like to know in this amount of time. If you don't hear back, maybe send a follow-up email. If you still don't hear back, maybe they just, they, they've decided to go another way. But that's not something that you need to concern yourself about because there are other interviews out there. And if your first one doesn't go great, your second one will. So definitely keep that in mind. You've got this and you'll get a job. Alrighty guys, thank you all again for joining me on another episode of our In Focus series about applying for jobs in the NHS. I really hope that I explained everything that you all wanted to know, but if there are still some questions or concerns that you have, feel free to either message us on our Facebook page or you can comment uh, down below on this, on this video and we'll try and get back to you as soon as possible. As always, if you've not already, please like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and subscribe to us on our YouTube channel. Thanks.